Hello. First, I'd like to say a big thank you to everyone attending our panel at South by Southwest 2021 remotely. Um, the focus of this panel is called Gamer Therapy. It's a concept that merges gaming with cognitive therapy. My name is Frank Cartagena. I'm the Chief Creative Officer at the Community in New York, which is an advertising agency. And I'd like to talk to you a little bit about what is Gamer Therapy. It's the platform that we launched ahead of World Mental Health Day this year to kind of break the stigmas between video games and therapy and get them closer together. We made a little video for you and I'd like to play that before we get into it. Let's wait till we get on the floor and then I can, I wanna tell you what's going on in my life. at Oxford University found that playing video games can actually be good for your mental health. Let me make sure I don't shoot you. those signs for you like how do you how do you start to tell that you're going into a bit of a depressive episode when we can express like anger in a healthy way with that it turns into like a motivating factor like passion i have a major case of anxiety that's something we could work on performance anxiety or stress like learning how to manage that We tend to say things to ourselves that we would never say to a friend. Yeah. But if we can ask ourselves, well, what would I say to a friend in this situation and practice saying it to yourself? So you kind of mean of like, you kind of mean like positive self-talk? Self-talk, yeah. When you take um, therapy out of a traditional space, it, it can definitely change the experience. In their comfort zone, there's a lot of defenses that are eliminated from the equation. It's so much nicer to play video games with another person. I think there's um, tremendous value, the limitless possibility of how that can have a positive impact. That process can get everyone excited about therapy. The idea is obviously called gamer therapy. And at the origin of the story is really an intern of mine he came into my office one day and he had this idea because he was browsing on Psychology Today and he was an avid gamer. And the article that he came across was called, uh, titled Video Games Are Social Spaces and How Video Games Help People Connect. And basically the, the idea of this article was about a, a study made of 5,800 messages inside the world of video games. And they found that contrary to popular belief, it wasn't all negative talk or talks about, um, you know, gaming itself, gamers were actually encouraging each other and, and sharing socio-emotional messages over task-oriented ones, which means they were sharing their feelings, both positive and negative, and over, say, you know, shoot that guy or what's behind the door. So his idea was to, to bring therapy within the game. And, you know, as advertisers, we have, you know, we're not experts in really anything, but especially not gaming and especially not, not therapy, but we had our own little theory that if you took these two unlikely things that both held their own stigmas and you put them together, it could help bridge the gap between the two. Um, now, like I said, I'm not the experts, but we have some experts with us. We have Todd Harris. He's the founder of Skillshot, which is a, a massive esports company. We have Jason Docton. He's the CEO of Rise Above the Disorder, which is a charity that believes in, in free mental health. And we have Natalie Moore, who's not just the star of the film you just watched. She's also a licensed marriage and family therapist. So I'll get into the questions for them. Um, the first question is, is for you, Todd. Why is gamer therapy something you wanted to be a part of? Just a little bit of a background. Todd was the first one that I called after, after we had this idea. So Todd? Thanks, Frank. Um, and I don't come from the mental health uh, field, as you mentioned, but I certainly know gaming. And I think the short answer is anytime I'm presented with an opportunity to help partners use video games to do some good in the world, 
my interest is peaked. And uh, this was such a unique idea. And I thought it was so needed at this time that I, I jumped at it. Um, as Frank suggested, between the two of us, we knew we would need additional partners that come from the world of mental health. But my background is that of developing games. So before starting Skillshot, I spent about 15 years making video games and publishing video games. And I, I saw that games are both incredibly popular and incredibly engaging. You know, as an industry, they're bigger than film and music combined. So they reach so many people and they also are incredibly engaging. The amount of time spent in gaming is more than those other industries. So it was very clear to me that gaming commands attention. But when I started the company Skillshot, it was all around what do we do with that attention? Can we use that attention to do some good in the world, to help people or make the world a little better. And your idea, Frank, your intern's idea, definitely had uh, a lot of potential, I thought. So I was very excited to jump on board and help make it authentic from a gaming perspective. I just knew we'd need some mental health professionals to make sure we delivered it the right way. Todd, that's actually a really great segue to, to Jason. Jason, what did you think when this, this idea first crossed your desk? Yeah, um, I thought the idea of gamer therapy was really interesting. Uh, I think for most people who have played video games a lot of their life, uh, connecting and talking about how you're doing, what's going on, is, is very natural. It's one of the first places that many of us began to open up and share what's going on in our world. And often the place we went to when we felt like it wasn't safe to do that somewhere else. Um, so the the idea of of using gaming in, in a therapeutic way was really enticing, really exciting. So when when it did come across your desk for the first time, um, was there anything about the original idea, which was when it came to you, I had wanted to live stream it on Twitch roulette um, in front of everyone. Uh, Todd was the first one to flag it as there's, you know, we're going to need some bots to moderate the conversation, but you were the first one to say, this is, this feels wrong. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Yeah. There's... <laughs> I think there's a lot of different pieces to this. Um, the idea of live streaming psychotherapy was really hard to agree with. There's, there's inherently no real way to consent to that process. What unfolds, what happens when we begin to open up about past experiences, our feelings, the things that, that cause us so much pain. Um, we don't know where that's going to go. We, in some way relinquish a bit of control and control being so important when we're in that vulnerable state, uh, we relinquish that to an open audience of people who now know things that maybe you didn't even know about yourself until it started to come up in real time in session. Um, that idea, you know, again, very hard to consent to, um, but also there's the, the kind of secondary pieces of you know, there's real work happening here. There's something really important taking place. It's a, it's beautiful and important to normalize and talk about, um, but also a very intimate process between a therapist and, and somebody seeking help. And in a way, we're kind of removing some of the intimate nature of that. Um, and so it, very, very hard to, to say yes to that initial approach of streaming it. Yeah, and, w and once you made me aware of that, it was it was a no-brainer to do it behind closed doors. Coming from an advertising perspective, I'm always looking how to make the idea as big as possible to be seen by as many people as possible. So, um, you know, the core of the idea wasn't the live stream. So we were able to keep with the integrity of the idea and actually make it a more legitimate thing. So, Natalie, I want to ask you one um what did you think when you first heard of this? And two, are you a gamer? So I was really excited to hear about this project. 
therapy tends to be this place that's enshrouded in mystery. When you enter therapy, you're going into this place you've never been with someone you've never met before who you're not going to know much anything about. And you're sharing such deep things about your life and you're sharing your soul with this person. So anything that I can do as a mental health professional to demystify therapy, make it feel more safe, more inviting, more exciting for somebody to engage in, I'm all on board with that. And secondly, to answer your question, I am an analog gamer. So my fiance and I play all the games, Clue, Boggle, Scrabble, Bananagrams. I kick butt at all the word related games. <laughs> he kicks butt at the math related games. I'm not much of a video gamer, although I do love old school arcades, if that counts. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'll leave it up to the experts if that counts. Does it count, guys? That counts. Totally, totally counts. <laughs> Okay. So, so um, talk to me a little bit about this, the stigmas, because we know there's a stigma, you know, associated with mental health. We also know that there's a stigma associated with gaming. And only in the past couple of years has gaming really become, you know, a, a massive enterprise. And, and I say a couple of years loosely, it's been, it's been happening for, for a while, but um, it went from me being a kid where nobody made a million dollars to play video games to now I know when my kids get older, they're going to say I can play video games because I can be a millionaire. So talk to me a little bit about the stigmas and, and what do you, you know, how do you feel about that? Sure. So getting through the stigma of mental health is obviously a huge barrier to getting care. And so one of the things that is really important to me is actually talking about my personal experiences with therapy. It's one thing to be a therapist and say that it's great. It's another to say, hey, this is not just something that I do as a profession. This is something that I've gained tremendous value from individually, as an individual, as a couple, and even as a family and as a child. I, I started, uh, I went to therapy when I was a little kid. I did play therapy. So I've had a lot of experience with it from the client perspective. So I think a huge part of breaking the stigma is being open about our own therapy experiences. So that's something I'm really passionate about. In terms of gaming stigma, you know, I actually fell into that myself. Uh, Jason, I don't know if you remember this, but when you first reached out to me and told me about your nonprofit, I assumed that it was to help people with gaming addiction. And I remember being super embarrassed. I apologize. I said, I can't believe I stigmatized the work that you do. And I actually had to challenge a lot of my own assumptions about gaming because as a mental health professional, we're often trained and taught to look for the signs of addiction. And we kind of equate gaming with something at worst addictive and negative harmful stuff, right? And at best, something that's a distraction or a waste of time. So I've had to, in this process of opening my mind to what gaming can do and help people with, I've had to challenge a lot of my own um, biases and misconceptions that I had. I love that, Natalie. If I can chime in, Frank, because I, I'd love to, to share my own personal uh, journey with gaming in the same way Natalie has, has shared it with therapy, because there definitely is the stigma Natalie spoke about with gaming and, um, you know, me being uh, over 50, you know, seventh grade me playing games. It, it feels like every five years, another batch of politicians are scapegoating gaming for whatever the ill happens to be. It's often violence in the real world, um, even though time and time again, uh, it has shown there's no scientific evidence uh, there of causation, uh, including the APA in 2020 reaffirming um, the lack of any causal link there. So, but personally, I mean, the, I, I credit my success in technology and in entrepreneurship to lessons I learned in video games. I, I've seen the same thing as a parent with my son, I've seen the same thing with young men and women in, in high school. Um, a kid who played uh, the game that I happened to make, um, Smite, for his varsity high school team 
and was, was attached to his high school because of that. He was confined to a wheelchair. So this was the only competitive activity that he could participate in. And it unlocked his aspirations of being a game designer. So, you know, I think there's these phases of uh, destigmatizing from, as Natalie said, a, a vice to something that's tolerated in, in small doses like like a junk food, but 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 I'm kind of on the the other extreme where I am definitely an advocate for it being done positively and as a parent. The same reason you would want your kid to play chess because it's intellectual and traditional sports because of teamwork and mastery and good sportsmanship. When delivered the right way, gaming delivers all these benefits. So, so another reason, as I shared, that I was so excited to attach myself to, to the project is to shine a, a light on the positive aspects of gaming, in this case, related to mental health conversations. Yeah, that's super interesting because you, you always hear that, you know, sports are the thing, right? It, it, it develops all sorts of good things. But now, especially since everything's online, you're playing multiplayer and you have teams, it's interesting that you've, you know, credited your success. And um, for whoever doesn't know what Smite is, Smite is how many active monthly users now? It <laughs> it's about, million? well, registered, it's over 70 million um, uh, players that have experienced that game. And, and it's, it, it, it's not even the most popular game. There are others that are even more popular. So, yeah, a lot of people play these games. Yeah, yeah, so in particular that one. Jason, what do you, how do you feel about the stigmas of, you know, mental health and gaming having, you know, being in, kind of bridging the gap between the two? Yeah. Yeah. You know, when, when I first started, um, our organization, we were actually called, uh, anxiety gaming. This was the name of our world of Warcraft guild that we began as, um, and I remember a lot of the times the, the feedback I got was mental health and gaming makes no sense that that's such a strange niche. Why would you focus on that? Uh, aren't games really bad for your mental health? And you know, while we, we didn't really know how to tell our story or, or to explain any of that, the second we ran into somebody else who was a gamer and explained, you know, or tried to explain its mental health and gaming, they immediately knew what we were talking about. Because for the longest time within gaming has been a group of people who have used gaming to socialize and engage and build communities where they can be themselves where they can be completely different from themselves for whatever reason they might have they got to express themselves in the way that they wanted to or they could just log off and start over and we when we started to build that up um, continue to try and echo what was happening within the gaming world why mental health is so important how games uh, are connected to our mental health. More and more people could understand that gaming has been this platform, this safe platform for people for a long time. Um, and this this idea of games being unhealthy or, or being toxic was increasingly getting washed away by more and more people becoming gamers and experiencing it firsthand. Toxicity that exists within games, I mean, it exists everywhere right? Um, the, the idea that games made people more violent was quickly dispelled. The ability to scapegoat games became diminished over time. And now it's this cultural phenomenon. And when we go to talk about mental health and games, people totally get it. And when we talk about games in general, people are, are usually pretty proud to share their favorite game, what they're about. You even see people start to almost kind of like rank each other. Like, yeah, I play like real games, like this and this and that, or like, no, I don't play league. I play Dota because Dota is for real players. Like, or no, Dota is way too extreme. Like I play league because league actually requires skill. And like, you see all of that and people are really proud um, of, of being able to share that kind of flair, being able to share that identity. Um, it's unfortunate that the stigma hasn't um, gotten better for therapy like it has for video games. That's very interesting. So um, I have a question for 
for you, Natalie. Um, obviously, you know, 2020 was a crazy year for everything. Um, but in particular, te telehealth. Talk to me about how everything kind of shifted in, in your world in the last year. It's interesting because 2020, I feel like, is a complete sentence now. You just say 2020 and it starts nodding their head. It shifted within a day because I was seeing clients in my office on a Thursday and then I was seeing clients via telehealth on a Friday. I literally had to figure everything out legally, ethically, technologically, financially, HIPAA, I mean, everything while also stocking up on a month's worth of groceries that day, okay? So it was really stressful, but we got it done. As a profession, we figured it out. We all got online because we had to. We had to for our own practices. We had to for our clients. You know, we knew that, first of all, they already had mental health issues that we were helping them with before the pandemic hit. And then the pandemic hit and we had to support them emotionally through all of that turbulence and obviously social justice movements, wildfires, you know, there was so much that happened in 2020, you know, the election. We, we needed to help people and they needed us to be accessible. So we got over our stuff and we got online. <laughs> That's great. And then gaming too, Todd, is, you know, how did that change? Yeah, it was the only game in town uh, for a little bit. I mean, certainly with traditional sports going on pause entirely, with with music concerts, theater, movies going on pause, um, it just put a spotlight on our form of media that is game playing and actually watching other people play games on platforms like Twitch and YouTube. So. Both of those, I mean, rose tremendously. They're at record heights at this point. And so um, I think the positives of that was, again, there were, there were new partners, new stakeholders, um, you know, NFL players, NBA players that are now playing the virtual version of their sport, uh, NASCAR racers that are now in a simulator playing e-racing. All of this happened, which is, is incredibly exciting for those of us in the game development industry or, or the game event production industry, because these, you're getting this cross-culture collaboration, traditional sports artists playing the virtual version or athletes, and also musical artists performing on live stream platforms. So, um, wasn't all rosy, certainly. A lot of businesses still had an in-person side of their business, holding events with real people, and everyone loves that experiential part, and, it, and, and there's a longing for that to return. But the industry, as, as Natalie said with hers, was able to pivot and make some sacrifices, change some things, but at least still deliver entertainment and more than that as jason mentioned deliver connection you know this is the social network for you know hundreds of millions of people on a monthly basis they get entertainment and they also connect and it it's just grown um with the pandemic yeah um and then how about just your business in general went from you know esports being you know, Madison Square Garden to, you know, all, all remote. Yeah, we shifted hard towards virtual events. So a, a lot of technology was deployed quickly. Um, you know, imagine a very, very fancy Zoom call, but talent being piped in from all over the globe, competitors playing all over the globe, dealing with internet latency and producing a virtual event. And um, so yeah, our business just pivoted from zero live events to all virtual events. And, and fortunately, there was such uh, a hunger in this demographic for causes and, and to, to give back. Again, we were, we were able to do a, a lot of good. I mean, when COVID hit, we, we did an event called COVID and it, it 
raised money for COVID relief. And you had Gronkowski challenging Ninja, the most famous gamer in the world. And they actually played against each other in Warzone. And you had these crossing of streams and it was all done from everyone's homes. So yeah, the industry in general and our business really kind of pivoted and, and tried to get back and tried to keep putting out entertainment. Yeah. It's actually super interesting that we have the three of you because Todd, you're, you're on the video game side, Natalie, you're on the therapist side and Jason, how did 2020 and COVID, which I don't even like talking about anymore, but how did that affect, you know, on your end of the spectrum and your, your business being that a lot more people are now playing video games? Yeah. I mean, you mentioned kind of the, the dual ends of the spectrum uh, with the, the panelists and, and Rad and, and myself are kind of square in the middle of this. Um, it, it was a, it was a brutal year. Um, I mean, just, just being transparent about it. You know, we, we offer free mental health care. Um, anywhere in the world, we help people find therapists. We cover the cost of those therapists with donations. It, it's a service that a lot of people need, depend on. Um, when you look at the world shifting in such a dramatic way, the way that it did, the need for a service like this just amplifies. Um, you have more and more people online, more and more people that are, are hearing about RAD, that are becoming aware of what we're doing and, and needing that help uh, almost immediately. You know, it was a lot of uh, initially just focusing on people that were dealing with the spike in anxiety. Um, they had anxiety disorders that were pre-existing this, and this made everything feel much more real. My, my fear of things outside is amplified and justified. My fear that something catastrophic could happen to me at any moment is justified now. Um, depression really starts to creep in over time. I've gone days, I've gone weeks, I've gone months now without seeing somebody, without engaging with somebody. Everyone is feeling fatigued. There's less people for me to talk to now because everybody needs their own time to comprehend and process what's going on. Um, we were starting to see a, a, a new um, demographic reaching out to RAD, people who were in therapy, who were on medication, who had health care, who had a job, and suddenly it was gone. And with that, everything kind of swept out from underneath them going and looking at their therapists and seeing how much it costs out of pocket to see them going through and, and now having to reevaluate, can I afford to live here anymore? Do, where do I go now? What do I do? You know, I can't find a way to get groceries, but also I don't know how much longer I can afford to have groceries. It, it, I mean, it was just really shocking for a lot of people and, and being, there to try and de-escalate, to try and absorb with them some of that initial shock, but then also help them understand the steps forward. We're doing all of this while many therapists, uh, as, as Natalie explained, are trying to figure out what to do. Some therapists that we were seeing took longer to go online than others. Some didn't have webcams, so they couldn't do anything with a camera. Some had really bad microphones, and so you couldn't understand them. We're trying to make sure that therapists are ready to see a lot of the people that we're sending over, but we're running into this bottleneck of, of a lot of therapists also being swept in this and not sure what to do. Well, my practice just closed down. I don't know if I should keep paying the, the lease on this place, or I don't know how to run a digital practice because now nobody at all is in the office, so I'm trying to figure all of this out. Um, as therapists start to adjust, it, it got a lot easier, but I mean, it realistically, we're, we're not out of it. Um, people are, are still losing jobs. They're still finding themselves uh, unable to continue care, continue medication, afford any of these things. And as we go a year plus, uh, you know, at this point, a lot of people who have really stuck it out, been um, sincere about staying home and, and keeping everyone safe, themselves included. Now it's it's gone past what they were able to do. Now it's it's just been way too long. 
um, and outside, even if staying home playing games has always been a desire, it, it's it's getting to be too much. So it is it has changed. Um, I guess the urgency uh, to to sum it up for Rad, it's changed the urgency for a lot of people to start seeking mental health. So tell me, um, I want to stay on you for just just a little bit longer. Sure. Um, are you, do you have a, a background in therapy or how did you get into this? I know you, you've been a gamer for <laughs> forever. Yeah. Um, yeah, but talk to us a little bit about how, you know, you got started in this and, and was it on purpose? Did you have a passion for therapy? <laughs> sure, sure. Um, I mean, where does it all begin? Uh, I think, you know, like many people, it, you know, it begins in a very disruptive household. It begins without very many resources. It begins without very much uh, help and internally feeling like there's very little hope. Um, you know, I didn't really connect with people growing up. And the first time I really started to make friends uh, was when Diablo came out and Diablo had Battle.net and I could talk with people online and I wasn't 10 anymore. I was 15 and I could hang out with people all over the world my age and be different than I guess who I was this this kind of at the time overweight um, certainly very uh, poverty stricken um, this I was something else and and I was playing as a warrior and I was geared out and I was good at dueling people and people judged me for that and not all of the other things that I was judged for um, and that just stayed, you know, as I developed, as I, as I got older, games were always in the background of it all, um, and played a, an important role for me. Um, as I uh, eventually made it into med school and, and was really focused on trying to, to help people, um, through medicine, uh, is when I really had my first big panic attack and, uh, it all kind of came crumbling down the ability to leave home, the ability to go to school, to work, it all kind of got swept away under this fear that, you know, I would maybe stop breathing suddenly or have a heart attack. And, um, you know, be, years go by at this point of not being able to leave, not being able to break that, that feeling. Um, and, and I think like many people do when they get to that point uh, of isolation, uh, they think of, of taking their life. Um, and in my mind, you know, that, that was, that was what I was going to do. Um, but I felt like I had owed it to the world in some way to, um, balance things out as, as if, you know, if I take my life, it just kind of subtracts from the world. Um, but maybe if I talk somebody else out of taking their life, it, it would balance out. Um, so I set off to do that in pretty much the only world that I, I, still existed in and, and at the time that was the world of warcraft um and it, it kind of worked uh, as i was reaching out trying to to talk with people trying to uh, convince them to to talk with me about how they were feeling um it was just a huge response uh, the response grew and grew until you know i wasn't thinking about taking my own life i was i was thinking about how many people are thinking about taking theirs and, and how do i stop that um, you know, one thing leads to a bigger community, all talking with people leads to, well, we need to find people, professionals local to them leads to, well, we find all of these professionals, but nobody can afford them. Then goes to, okay, well, let's just start crowdfunding people's mental health care. Um, and so that's what we did. We kept raising money for people to, to afford mental health care for themselves, paying their therapists for them. Uh, we get noticed by this huge band, Imagine Dragons, who fundraises with us. Um, and we raise enough money to, to help, I, I think at the time, what was like maybe 3,000 people. Um, it was an incredible journey. And by the time we had done all of that, I, I was exhausted. I felt like I had... Uh, done all of the cool things I had made friends helped a ton of people and, and I was I was okay with just staying home um, not living this nonprofit life but but just going back to playing video games again um, and that's what I did for 
for a while um, until uh, I, I uh, got an email from this 19 year old um, who had just experienced this terrible tragedy. Um, you know, lots of people would reach out, ask us if we were still finding people, therapists, paying for these therapists. But, you know, we'd tell them like, yeah, we, we hung up that hat. Like we did that for thousands of people. Like we're, we're just tired now. We're, we're just playing games, but you can play with us, join our guilds. Um, so that's, that's what we did. But bet this, uh, this particular person, uh, we couldn't, we couldn't say no. Um, they had very tragically lost their family uh, in an accident one night and um, instead of of a social worker or, or someone coming to check up on them um, they were kind of just left alone in their home they were left there until uh, the bank that uh, held the mortgage for that home foreclosed on it leaving them homeless and they just happened to hear about us at some point prior to this um, from a content creator, this, this Twitch streamer, Trick2G, and decided to, to reach out through a, a public library computer. Um, and so we, we talked with them, uh, agreed, you know, we gotta, we gotta get our stuff back together. We gotta help this person. You know, we can't just, just let them be stuck like that. Um, and we set out to do that. Um, but, you know, we, we very quickly realized how limited the mental health care system was. Um, you know, they lived in a rural area. There were no clinicians near them, no therapists nearby to see them. We start looking in the major cities and, and just everything they're going through really required very intensive treatment. So we need to find inpatient uh, treatment for them. And then we start talking with inpatient facilities. And because this person's only 19, doesn't have insurance, it's 10,000 plus dollars a month, every month, you know, they would have a place to stay. They would have clothes, they would have food, they'd have treatment, but 10,000 a month. I mean, even living in LA, that's not, uh, that's not rent, um, for most of us. Um, so we, we tried everything that we could to, to make that possible, but, uh, we, we just didn't know how, um, you know, a lot of our fundraising in the past was selling things in game, things that we couldn't do anymore. Uh, now that we were this nonprofit, um, now that people in some of these game developers were aware and, you know, uh, aware that we were doing that in the past. Um, but without that, there was no way. And, you know, after a month of, of trying to fundraise, of putting disability checks together of, you know, a dollar here and there to try and pay for just the first month, um, they end up taking their life and, uh, it became all too real to me. Uh, what was at stake that myself, like many of the others in our, our guild, our nonprofit at the time, um, were home all of the time because we couldn't afford help. Uh, we, we didn't have access to those resources. And this person had lost their life because they couldn't afford help. Um, you know, something had to change. And, and that's, that's kind of where RAD and, and our nonprofit comes from is this, this just idea that everybody deserves this, that there's so many people within our community that, that need access to this. Um, and, and making that possible is, is why I'm here is, is, is the motivation behind all of it is, is, you know, where my experience comes from. That's very, yeah, no, it's, it's very powerful. Thanks for sharing. Um, and it, it, it got me thinking of, you know, my next question is for you, for you, Natalie, of, of where do you see, you just heard Jason talk about for the first time of how, you know, how everything came about. I look at this project as the start of something. Um, it is, it is an idea or a theory. Where do you, where could you see it going for, you know, moving forward, you mentioned as well, you know, you do a lot of play therapy. Is this, is this type of thing, it doesn't have to be exactly gamer therapy, but moving forward, how do you see this coming to life or extending? I see it having such great potential in three different areas. One 
increasing access and awareness of mental health to improving the relationship between the therapist and the client, which by the way is the greatest predictor of how effective therapy will be. And three, actually a promising intervention for therapists to use with clients. So we'll talk a little bit about each of these. So the first one being access. So like Jason is talking about with his nonprofit, he's able to connect with real gamers in real time and understand what their challenges are and offer them these amazing services, right? Secondly, with increasing the, the therapeutic relationship, like I was saying, you know, in the beginning, it's so hard to even reach out to therapy and feel comfortable opening up in therapy because you're on somebody else's turf. You're with somebody who they're an expert in the field, right? But if you have an opportunity to meet with a therapist inside of a game, you're the expert. That's your turf. You're comfortable there. You're familiar there. You're more likely to break down your barriers and get out of, um, kind of get out of your shell a little bit more, right? And then, you know, thirdly, talking about interventions, there's so much to explore inside of a video game. Therapists can develop so much more insight on their clients based on how they interact with the game, what games they choose to play, how they play them, how they show up in those games. There's a lot of strengths that you can reflect back to your client that you can see them showing up, you know, and demonstrating in these games and find ways to help them leverage that in their, in their real life. Um, so I see a lot of potential here. I think it, it comes to a place where mental health professionals have to open their minds to maybe leaving behind some of the dogma or some of the ways they've been trained to do therapy and see therapy and look through a new lens and see how therapy can be adapted to the new world that we're all creating together. Yeah, that's great. And Todd, what about you? I know this isn't the only you know, charitable thing you do. But when, when I initially called you and talked to you about this, you said, you know, this is, this is a lane I, I'd like to play in. I think those were the exact words. And, you know, how do you see it moving forward with Skillshot or, you know, whether with this particular project or making it bigger or, or other, you know, philanthropic things through gaming? Well, Jason's story is so powerful. He had shared that with me in confidence um, when we were exploring this. And um, of course, it uh, only motivated me to, to try to help uh, more um, the way he has. So I think, uh, I mean, specific to mental health and gaming, I actually see two very specific things, um, opportunities that, that we plan to do. Um, I guess this comes from a little bit of a hypothesis, almost in Jason's case, where sometimes there's a correlation between gamers and anxiety and depression. And I do not think gaming causes that, but I think gaming is a coping um, mechanism. This is just a, a theory that research hasn't proven yet. But I think, uh, as Jason shared, it's a way to, to be someone else, to connect with other people, and it can be... Uh, a positive uh, modality, I guess, that, that gamers are just opting into on their own. So the two very specific things. Um, the first is that gaming, video game playing is being more adopted now at the collegiate level and at the high school level. Educators are slowly understanding that this can be a good thing. So there's a nonprofit I'm involved with called NASIF, and it's basically video games in a K through 12 setting, all for positive student outcomes. And there's a big emphasis on wellness. And um, there's some paper tools, such as checking in with yourself as a player regularly, the same way a sports player would before their game warm up and maybe check their physical and mental conditioning. So there's a framework that already exists there for, for young people. You know, really we're talking about middle school and high school, the kind of, do some check-ins and that's everything from their diet, their sleep, their balance, their nutrition, et cetera. Um, so that is a chance to, to introduce a concept of, of mental health very early, hopefully, and destigmatize it. And then really based on gamer therapy, the, the, and Frank, this is to your credit of awareness, you know, we did generate a lot of awareness and there's a, 
local university. I'm in Atlanta and Georgia Tech is a great engineering university there with a lot of gamers and a researcher reached out to me wanting to explore this and, and maybe come up with an automated toolkit for players to check in with themselves. And since I'm a developer and a gamer, anything that's automated, you know, I'm, I'm picturing kind of red, yellow, green, and, you know, some kind of way to uh, almost gamify this check-in, right? Um, that, that could be a piece of software. So that's another future opportunity that I think was opened up by this that we did together. So that's, yeah, that's super interesting. And uh, Jason, what about you? I know you've talked about actual like massive grand plans for, for yourself moving forward. Anything you want to talk about? Um, you know, I think when it, when it comes to, to gamer therapy, the, the future to me looks like exploring how to use games in in sessions how how to leverage the relationship that games can build between people um you know we look at what's called a, a temporary coalition you know when we when we barely have a unified goal that we're working towards um there's so much power within that to advance relationships to build trust you know when you're talking with with uh, uh, somebody that's that's quite young, somebody that maybe experienced trauma from an adult, um, learning how to trust adults, unfamiliar adults, learning how to to build communication can be really hard. Games have an ability to rebuild trust in that way, uh, building something together, going against a boss together. You know, I think games moving in 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 directions like that isn't isn't something I expect. I don't expect games to become more clinical so much as as clinicians to become more familiar with games and how to utilize the power of the relationship buildings uh, building that games can have, um, utilizing that uh, more and more with uh, younger and younger demographics that are otherwise harder to reach. Um, you know, the, the future to me, you know, from, from Rat's perspective is, is to just continue to grow this idea, this fundamental belief that, that everybody deserves mental health care, to make it more and more approachable to, you know, as we are now really offer to cover the cost of services for people who are very much unable to afford them, need, need significant help financially, um, and to continue to kind of raise that up so that the financial uh, requirement is is less and less strict, like it like it should be. Like the the reality that you know initially I have no other way to afford this. To you know it would just be really hard right now, or I could really use that money towards something else. To I don't know. I sh I don't want to have to pay for this. I just need help. Um, you know, being able to to scale to that degree is is really what's uh, on the horizon for me. That's great. Um, yeah. So I think we're I think we're running you know up up t time. So I'd like to thank everyone um, for joining this remote gamer therapy panel, and thank you, Natalie, Todd, and Jason. And I'd like to give all three of you, let's start with, with you, Todd, a chance to, I did brief intros at the beginning, but, you know, maybe just go through what each of you do, how to contact you if anyone's interested in following up, because we do not have, you know, a live Q&A this year. So maybe that's, this is a chance if anyone has any questions or, you know, whatever. Um, floor is yours, Todd. Okay, I'll keep it. Brief, yes, if you're uh, a brand out there and looking to connect with gamers, um, whether it's positive social impact for your cause or you just want to throw a really hype event, uh, we're at Skillshot Media and it's uh, skillshot.com. So look forward to having any conversations with, with interested, curious gamers out there. Great, what about you, Natalie? Sure, thank you so much, Frank, for moderating. And of course, South by Southwest for having us here. Um, my name is Natalie Moore. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. I provide telehealth counseling to all of California. And if you want to learn more about me and what I do, you can go to my website, which is awakentheself.com. Jason. Yeah, thank you. 
for the opportunity, uh, honestly, to to share more about what we do, to, to really bring us all together to talk more about this intersection between games and mental uh, mental health, mental well-being. Um, for those that are listening and, and curious about starting therapy, have, have wanted to start therapy but haven't been able to because of the cost, I encourage you to reach out. Our website is urrad.org, Y-O-U-A-R-E. RAD.org. And certainly, if you are interested in a future where everybody has access to mental health care and want to support us, you're welcome to do so through the same website. Yes. Uh, like you, you know, Jason's been saying the whole time, he offers free therapy. That is, he also accepts donations to enable that to be a possibility. So he won't say it, but I will. Um, thanks again, everyone. And um, hopefully, you enjoyed it. Bye.